guests. Um, uh, we're gathered here to uh, learn all about uh, the Thai economy with a very distinguished panel and our um, Dean of the Faculty of Political Science uh, here, Dr. Ek Tangsupafatna, will start the proceedings. Over to you. Excellencies, distinguished uh, participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Good morning and welcome to today's ISIS uh, public forum on Thailand's uh, upgrading and growth equalities. Thailand's economy barely expanded uh, by 0.7% uh, uh, last year. And growth forecast for uh, 2015 uh, has been revised downwards again and again from 4% down closer to 3%. Why Thailand trend growth is partly attributable to a uh, long political conflict. Structural constraints in the Thai economy pose a more serious and lasting concern for future economic expansion. Even if Thai politics is more stable, the Thai economy is still in trouble because it has been stuck in a so-called middle income trap for more than a decade. Sandwiched back between neighboring economies that offer either higher skills and value added or lower labor costs. As a result, Thailand's economic growth had reached a prey to with downsized list. Its upward trajectory cannot be taken for granted. Managing growth with relative stability and equity as an upper middle income economy requires less emphasis on labor intensive industries and greater reliance on economic upgrading and moving up to uh, global value chains. Why they are integrated into regional and global production networks, Thai industries and firms have yet to move up value chains by innovating, upgrading, and capturing more values. Economic upgrading is thus imperative for the future expansion of the Thai economy. This public forum aims to assess Thailand's current growth capabilities, strategies, and policies that can lead to economic upgrading and sustain economic uh, expansion going forward. You might ask why we are holding a seminar on Thai economy at this time. The answer is twofold. We want to assess the immediate prospects of for Thailand's economic downturns, but at the same time, we also want to look at uh, medium and long-term structural challenge in a constructive fashion. How can we keep Thailand's imp impressive growth story on track going forward? We all have a common vested interest in seeing the Thai economy expand on the sound and sustainable footing for many years to come. This forum will seek and try to, te to tease out some of the insights and ways to do uh, so. Let me thank all of the speakers and uh, moderators for uh, spending their precious time with us. 
uh, Associate Professor uh, Pavida uh, Pananut and uh, Dr. Kilida Pau Pichit, uh, Dr. Rung uh, Bosayanon Marika, uh, Marikamat, uh, Dr. Dendeng Nikom Borilak, and also uh, our senior uh, fellow, uh, Miss Gwent Robinson. Um, I can say with some certainty that uh, this may be the first ever, or at least a really rare uh, panel that uh, features all uh, female experts. They are experts first, female second, and you probably have seen them on other economy related panels uh, elsewhere in the past, but here they are all uh, together. Let me also note that the speaker light up has uh, achieved slightly. Uh, Dr. Lung of uh, Bank of Thailand will kick off, uh, followed by Dr. Gilida of the World Bank. And then after that, uh, Dr. Pavita will continue and expand on the discussion with Dr. Denden as the fourth uh, speaker. We will begin with near-term prospects for growth this year, but we'll then focus on medium and long-term growth and upgrading imperative and circular issues, including value chains and up -sealing. Where possible, the speaker may constructively uh, touch on policy considerations uh, for the incumbent government in terms of promoting Thailand's overall economic development. Uh, many thanks for all of you to uh, stay with us here, and uh, I hope that we are going to have a fruitful uh, discussion. And may I return uh, the floor to uh, Kun Gwent. Thank you. Um, as Dr. Eck mentioned, historic panel, all women, um, all <laughs> I don't know if we're professionals first, women second, but anyway, you can decide. Uh, we'll kick off with Dr. Rung of the Bank of Thailand, um, who uh, is going to speak just a day before the Bank of Thailand is due to release its, uh, its latest uh, uh, estimate. So um, I know you're in a slightly tricky position, Dr. Rung, but I know you can handle it. Uh, very well. Over to you, please. Yes, it is indeed a, an awkward day for me to be talking about the near-term growth projection for uh, Thailand. Well, first of all, I can't say I don't know about it, <laughs> what, what the figure is going to be, because usually, you know, when, when, when reporters ask me, I can say, oh, we, we're still in the process of reviewing it. But apparently today, I can't say that because the figures are, are due to, to be released tomorrow. Um, however, since my boss is going to be doing the, the, the talk, I should, uh, you know, do it ahead of him or else I'll be sacked. Um, <laughs> so I can just touch uh, broadly uh, on, on this, but uh, let's not delve into the, the exact figure. Um, many of you, um, well, might know that uh, the Bank of Thailand's latest estimate was released in March and we had the number of 3.8. But if you look at these figures that I, that, that I show up here, um, you would see, uh, let, let's go to the right-hand panel, the upper panel, you would see that uh, not, not just the Bank of Thailand, but, but here I show the NESDB, which is the, 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 the National Economic and Social Development Board's uh, figures, and also the Men uh, Ministry of Finance. Uh, the FPO, Fiscal Policy Office, um, you, you can see that the, the, the broad direction of uh, forecast adjustment uh, for, for Thailand, uh, which is downward, uh, it's pretty clear. We, you probably would notice too that, that the release come out on uh, different dates, different months. We, we coordinate it that way. So the, the next one in June would be ours, which is uh, due tomorrow. So you can probably expect it to go down. <laughs> 
uh, that much is uh, fairly clear. But in any case, if you compare it to last year, um, the, the, sl the steepness of the slope is definitely less. <laughs> I just want to point that out. Last year, of course, we had a significant uh, event that uh, we didn't expect uh, before. So, so when we first start our uh, 2014 growth forecast, we began at around five to five percent, and toward the end of the year, it became below uh, one. So, so it was a difficult year for all forecasters. This year probably less challenging, but still, there are a lot of uh, downside risks still, and as said, tomorrow we're going to be revising our growth forecast downward from the figure 3.8, um, mainly because we have seen that the export performance have been uh, weaker than expected, and um, this, and I think we have done uh, quite a bit of a study on this. We know that in part it is explained by the world structure. World growth, well, world growth is not doing that great. It's uh, in, on the whole probably doing a little better, but very slowly. Um, that has an implication on our uh, export forecast. And also with China, which is a significant, um, the, the number one trading partner for us, um, China is uh, weakening. So, so, so that would have an implication on our export forecast uh, directly. But I think. Another revelation that we have had is that it's not all about the world. It's also about us, about uh, Thailand. And I'm going to show some, some figures here. Well, first of all, look at this figure. This shows the problem. What, what, the, the joy of being the first speaker is that you can point out all the symptoms and you don't have to give much suggestions as to how to cure uh, the, the problems. But okay, I, I guess that's my job, at least to point out the symptoms of Thailand. This I plot, or my staff has helped me to plot uh, 20 year, 25 years growth uh, path of Thailand. Um, we don't try to suggest that uh, the, the red lines are either potential growth or whatever, but basically that's more or less the average growth that we have seen. It's very clear. Prior to the Asian crisis, our growth, whatever you call it, potential, average, was probably around 8%. Afterwards, it became 5 to 6, and of late, 2 to 3. Okay. Um, for forecasters, it's very difficult because we're still stuck in the five to six <laughs> range. You know, I mean, our frame of thinking, and we always start with five to six, and we end up around two to three every year. So that uh, we need some structural adjustments ourselves too. You know, in, in doing in doing a growth forecast. But this is something that we cannot deny. And if it's year in year out, two to three percent. It's something that we have to think very hard about. In fact, I, I was struck when Dr. Aid was mentioning that how do we sustain the impressive growth story of Thailand? It seems like we have lost it for a few years already. You know, I mean that. that but but I think it's a well. I mean, all crises or all short-term problems are ways that we should you know think about the future, and the future should be better for. So this is a challenge for us, and um, we should cope with it, you know, and I guess that's uh, why we're here today. Okay, this is a part, slide that I want to show that it's about the world changing, but it's also about Thailand. Um, the blue line is something that you can think of. Uh, here I said trading partner, that means Thailand's trading partner uh, GDP, okay, but you can think about it as world growth, world GDP. It, it will look just something like this. Okay, well, GDP has been growing, maybe not spectacularly, but at least it's uh, growing. What you would notice is that the slope of the green line and the blue line used to be quite close. Okay, the, they're, the two axes are not the same, but they used to have one correlation, one ratio of growth. But of late, especially after the GFC, you see the two diverge. Do you see the green line diverging? That means that Asia exports volume have not uh, been sustaining the same ratio as world growth. And this is not just about Asia. Globally, if you plot trade growth, you'll see this. Okay, So that means all countries, you cannot rely on your neighbors as much as before. You cannot rely on the big guys as much as before. There are many explanations to this, you know, global, uh, 
supply chain growth was very strong earlier in the early 2000, now it's less so. I mean, there are many stories and we're probably going to touch on them uh, later. But look at the red line. That's where I want to point out. Yes, the green shows everyone else, but the red shows Thailand. It shows that we have done even worse than other people. Export growth have been, well, near zero for two years. This year, probably a third. Okay, So, so it's here that, that, that it seems like, yes, we can blame it on the world, but it's not just about the world changing. It's us also that uh, has been doing not so great. Some of the symptoms that we have seen is that, uh, first of all, Thailand has been slow to move up the value chain. Here, I use the IMF uh, data on sophistication of exports index. Basically, they look at the most affluent nations and see what types of uh, merchandise that nation or group of nations export and then compare whether other nations export the same types of goods or not. If you export the same types of goods as the most affluent uh, nations, then you're supposed to be quote unquote sophisticated. Okay? It's no, like, this is not you know, the best indicator, I'm sure, but at least it gives you some sense and we, we sort of agree with, with this, so that's why I, I show it to you, is that, first of all, you see Thailand in red, and then you see China. <clears throat> the first thing is that you notice that uh, China, while they started out in the early 2000, not uh, being as sophisticated in terms of the export uh, bundle that they send out of the country, now they have definitely surpassed Thailand. That's one thing. Um, we have not caught up with other countries. And since the GFC, I think we have uh, not doing, been doing that well. I mean, I think that's the, 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 the general point. And it's that uh, we're still struggling to move up the value chain, and some figures can, uh, can validate that. The right panel is the one that I love to show, personally. It, <laughs> it just shows that 2014 export value growth in electronics. Okay, um, a lot of times, you know, I mean, for the Bank of Thailand, people comment that the bot is too strong, the world is so bad, or whatever. But here, all nations face the same global demand in electronics. Many nations in there have stronger currencies than we do. Some don't. Yes, I, I agree with that. But let's say, on average, there are people who uh, their whose currency strengthen more than ours and some uh, not not that way, but look at us. Our exports of electronics, the worst. And sad to say that electronics is actually one of the better export sectors of Thailand. <laughs> so we're like 1.8 percent growth last year, and then you look at the Philippines. The Philippines is doing it 12 percent. This is the same world, the same bad world that we face. So it says something about what we export, okay? And it's going to be clear, and many of you is probably clear already, that we export the stuff that people don't want. Okay, basically, the world is moving into smartphones and tablets. We're still stuck with HDD, hard disk drives, and things like that. This explains part of the story. That, like, that, that's why. I mean, it's not like the global electronics demand is not growing. I mean, people do buy smartphones every day. But we just don't get a significant share of that growing demand. So we have to think very hard about it. Like, how can we tap the growing sector and let go of the not-so-spectacular sectors? And we need to do a lot of structural change uh, with us. Okay. And this picture is just to show that um, in terms of global supply chain, I I'm not going to go into too much of this, but uh, um, I think it's also show that there are other countries who, with the global supply chain being more complex, um, we have not been able to tap into that so much as other countries. For example, Malaysia in this figure, you would see lines connecting Malaysia to the world being thicker and uh, more numerous, and maybe slightly, than, the, than, than ours, for example. 
another part that uh, another types of symptoms uh, and uh, explanation to to some extent is that we have not been tapping so much FDI. Okay, um, this I just pick Vietnam, and this is just. It, it doesn't mean that we tap less FDI than we Vietnam, but compared to the economy, the size of the economy to, to GDP, um, we have been getting a smaller share of, of FDIs. Um, well, I don't mean that we need FDI to grow. What, what, what I want to point out here is that, well, FDI firms do look at uh, the same factors affecting their growth, just like Thai firms. If FDI firms are not looking at us, Thai firms are also not looking at us. Maybe they're looking elsewhere also. Okay, so so it's the same constraints in, in many ways that firms face, whether or not they're expat or they're local firms. So so this is clear that we have been getting less FDI. It's actually not that troubling in and of itself because we know we got a lot of FDIs earlier in the 1980s. And when you look, talk to Japanese firms, they say, oh, this is normal. You got so much. So now it's just maintenance, right? I mean, kind of like uh, they need to tap into new and growing markets. OK, that, that story is quite comforting to some extent. And then the Bank of Thailand, we, 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 we are the ones who to, to gather the FDI figures. But so when we break down our FDI figures that has been less compared to the past, there's another surprising story. Of those that come in, they are no longer green field, they're no longer in production. You see the green bar on the left, uh, on the right hand side panel. Before we used to get Toyota, we used to get Honda. Now we get M&As. Well, people come into financial sector, uh, you know, uh, Japanese banks, acquiring Thai banks, but these are not production based. This is just to tap into the, the consumer market here. So that is another shift. So it also suggests that, uh, you know, in terms of factors supporting production, that's something we have to, we have to think about. And here, Dr. Ake mentioned something like innovation. Yes, I do agree. We need to move ourselves. We have been stuck here in this efficiency-driven um, stage for, for, for quite a while. And by efficiency means, okay, you transfer people from agricultural sector into manufacturing sector, they become more productive, or you put in more capital, they become more productive. But I think the next stage, I mean, given now we have the lowest unemployment rate in the world, I used to say, uh, the second lowest, because I think the Vatican City would have the lowest unemployment rate. <laughs> but now, with the ex-pope being in retirement, we may have the lowest unemployment rate. Uh, you know, less than 1%. Uh, um, well, you know, I, I, it shows something about the, the very tightness of, of the, the, the Thai labor market. And we cannot rely more on people moving from agriculture into manufacturing. Those who could move have already moved. You know, uh, those who are stuck in agriculture are probably the ones who are, you know, at the margin cannot really move. They're either too old or uh, they don't have the educational qualifications to move into the, the manufacturing sector, for example. Okay, so we need to change the growth model. The world has changed. We have also changed, and I think that, that is the more important part. Our endowment, the ones, the things that we used to enjoy are no longer with us, so we have to look for new growth factors. And here, I think Gurida would, would agree with me that we have to move into you know more innovation based. But look at the scoring on things that would allow you to have innovation, things like uh, higher education, where do lag behind uh, countries like Malaysia and Taiwan. Actually, I just want to point out that in terms of market size, in terms of macroeconomics, we don't do that bad in terms of, uh, well, th this is a year after the coup. I mean, we don't do that bad in terms of macroeconomy. You know, it's quite fine. And in terms of goods market efficiency, labor market efficiency, okay, there are room for improvement, but it's not the part that stands out. You know, things that stands out like technological readiness, innovation, institutions, law enforcement, kind of like that, infrastructure, of course, higher education and training. These are the stuff that would require a lot of work and we need to, to, to cope with them. 
you know. And I think I'm going to pause here. I do have some suggestions, but let's wait for the, the second round. So I just do my work and, you know, showing you some troubles that we have. Now over to Dr. Kirida of the World Bank, who uh, recently had just briefed uh, recently on the uh, World Bank's release of its annual Thailand Economic Monitor, uh, which actually gave a growth forecast of 3.5% for 2015, along with uh, many other points, which I'm sure you're going to uh, recap here. So over to you, Dr. Kirida. Such a pleasure to be here this morning. Thank you, Dr. Titinan, for inviting um, this lovely panel here today as well. I'm so uh, uh, pleased to be able to actually probably what I'm going to do is take you a bit, you know, through what it, Thailand is probably going to face over the next, let's say, you know, three to five years and um, what changes that we probably need to do in order to sustain you know, our growth um, if we were to escape the middle income trap, as Dr. Egg has mentioned um, a bit earlier. So, you know, I would like to first, you know, give you a snapshot of where Thailand is today first, right? So we are at the moment what uh, is categorized as an upper middle income country which means that our per capita income a year is you know in, in the range of four thousand to whatever twelve thousand you know US dollars uh, per person per year. So we have actually moved over the last you know twenty years from a low income country, right, to become an upper middle income country. So the next step that we would move to would be a high income country. But usually what happens is that it's easier to move from a lower income country to higher income because, you know, easy, you know, structural adjustments or, uh, you know, regulatory reforms, you know, have been done. When you're in now in the middle income situation, there are tougher things to do and there are more competitors as well, right, compared to 20 years ago when Thailand was a, middle in, was a low income country. So, you know, with all that, you know, it's now not as easy to move from middle income to high income country, which is the term a middle income trap. And um, as Dr. Egg mentioned, you know, Thailand has been in a middle income status for probably the last 25 years. You know, as, you know, as far back as the World Bank had started categorizing, um, classifying countries according their, to their per capita income, Thailand has always been a middle income country and we started categorizing or classifying in 1985. So, so we've been here for a while um, and now you know, we're trying to see what do we need to do next to move up the value chain to become a high income country such as you know Malaysia has expired that you know by you know 2020 it will become a high income country well Thailand hasn't set that you know sort of a target but in many statements that you know senior government officials or ministers have come out to say it's implicit that we also would like to move you know, up the value chain and become a, a, a high income country but um, as Dr. Rung mentioned that, you know, we're not growing too fast. We haven't been growing very fast in the past few years. To become a high income country, we probably need to grow faster than even 3.5. Of course, I mean, if we keep going 3.5, it would take us you know, much longer time to, to get into a high income status. Um, but here you can see that, as Wen mentioned, that our growth forecast this year is up to 3.5%. And it's mainly driven, as you see in the orange bars, by export of services, which is tourism, and public spending, you know, whether it be investment or government consumption, right? So as you can see here that, you know, we're not seeing any you know, spectacular growth in exports anymore or in private investment, which are, you know, essential, you know, factors that would drive an economy, you know, forward in the next, you know, five to ten years, right? We would need investments, we would need to be competitive in our exports. But before I, I, I get to that, I would just like to mention that, you know, we were still going to grow at around 3.5, coming from a low base of 0.9% last year. Well, the, the NESDB, the planning agency, has just revised um, its uh, the gross domestic product or the GDP numbers, so it's now 0.9 growth last year. Um, 
so coming from that base, we will grow, we will see growth at 3.5%. I mean, you know, coming from these factors. And of course, the low oil prices is also you know, a plus for, for growth this year as well. So, you know, when I look into Thailand's future, right, so let me point out some of the opportunities we have first before I go to the challenges. You know, I, I see lots of opportunities for Thailand, actually. Um, and it's up to us whether we can harness these opportunities or not. Right? As I mentioned to you, oil prices you know, will remain at, at this low level. It would not go back to $100 per barrel in, in the foreseeable future. Right? We see that you know, there is a lot of capital coming into East Asia, including Thailand as well. As Dr. Rung mentioned, that you know, maybe most of that is now in, in the form of merger and, and acquisitions, but they're still coming into Thailand. And as you can see in this graph, that um, even last year when we had the political you know, um, situation as such, our foreign direct investments that came into Thailand had, did, didn't collapse. Right? It was still at that, you know, at that high respectable level. So, you know, so we're still in an attractive uh, position, I would say, you know, along with other you know, East Asian countries, including Vietnam, China, um, or even Myanmar at the moment, right? And we ourselves also know right, that, that we are attractive, so we do also form ourselves into the ASEAN economic community and so forth, so that you know, as a group, you know, we could uh, be more attractive and we could also then you know, compete with, with other um, you know, groups of countries in the world as well. And we're, we're in a, you know, a great region. <laughs> That's what I had to say, right? We're, we're a fast-growing region. We're near China, although we see China is slowing down, but it's still, you know, a very large economy, a lot of purchasing power there. China, you know, growth slowing down means it's going to grow at 7.1%, you know, which is still quite high for a second largest economy in the world, right? So, so there are these opportunities that, you know, that, you know, that we have, um, and, and why not, you know, harness them? So, you know, these are just some graphs that I had prepared to show you, you know, of what I just mentioned earlier, that you know, we're in a region that's growing the fastest in the world. You know, EAP is East Asia Pacific. The one before us, SAS is South Asia, meaning India. You know, we're in the, we're in the region, we're in Asia, which is growing the fastest in the world, so no wonder why we are very attractive for foreign direct investors, right? If we zoom down a bit more, right, into our, you know, our, our ASEAN uh, countries, we're also seeing that, you know, we're surrounded by very fast-growing economies, right? Maybe they, they, you know, the size of their economies might not be as large as ours, such as in Vietnam or in uh, Cambodia or in or in Laos, in Myanmar, but they're growing very quickly. So that means that, you know, the the demand, you know, for goods are, are growing very quickly. It's growing very quickly as well. So, I mean, you can interpret the left chart two ways, right? That we're surrounded by fast-growing neighbors, which is great. But on the other hand, you can say that, wow, but, you know, everybody's growing faster than Thailand. So that's the other implication as well. So you know, I'm an optimist, so I, I tend to look at it in a positive light. But, but I'll, I'll show you some of the challenges as well for Thailand um, going forward if we, you know, if we um, continue to grow this slowly. The right, the right chart just shows that well, when Thai, you know, businesses see that, you know, Thailand's growth is not as fast as other countries, they actually go abroad. They actually go and invest abroad. And I think that's the topic for the next ISIS discussion, I see, next month, right? So, um, you know, we, you know we, we see a lot of Thai companies, as you can see, you know, going abroad. And, and that level has, has you know, been, been rising since 2007. The, the peak was at 2012, but, um, you know, the, the general trend is that it, it's rising. So, so the strength of Thai companies are also something that I see, you know, as, as um, you know, a, a benefit or a, a strength that Thailand has, right? And, and of course, eventually, you know, the global economy is recovering, although it's, it's quite slow. It, it's, it's recovering, um, not as fast as we had anticipated earlier. It's going to be uh, led by the U.S. The global growth will be led by the U.S., um, which is a, a major market for Thailand as well. So, so that's also, you know, uh, something that we would benefit from. But of course, 
you know, coming closer to home, uh, China. China will grow, will slow down, but as I mentioned to you, slowing down means 7%, right, for China. Um, so, you know, but it will slow down, so that will definitely affect our exports to China, our investments in, uh, you know, to China will be uh, affected. But look at India. India is sort of now like the new rising star of Asia, right? India is forecasted to grow you know, quite quickly, um, surpassing China's growth, although it, the size of its economy is not as big as China, but its growth will be, will be greater, and um, it has benefited a lot from the fall in oil prices as well. So, so we can see that you know, we're in this region where, okay, if we see China slowing down, you know, if we were to take the advantage of you know, India growing, we might have to you know, diversify our investments or exports to India, for example. And, but that means you know, thinking about a different product mix right, that would cater to this new market. You know. So basically, we would probably need to adjust ourselves that's you know that's that's the um, the message here. The other adjustment we would probably need to make is you know is for China because if we are going to remain in this you know market which is in the second largest in the world at the moment and could become the largest in the next 20 years, you know we would have to also adjust our own product and service mix that we you know that we trade with China. This, these two charts are taken from a report that the World Bank um, did with the, um, the Chinese um, think tank in China, looking at what China's economy will be in 2030, right? And um, here we see that, you know, with the government's policy, Chinese government's policy in place, it's not too difficult to see, you know, the, the trend in China, that, you know, China would try to move away from you know, over investments basically. And they will try to uh, stimulate more consumption within their country. So if you look, you know, ahead to 2030, if you want to trade with China, it's probably going to be more in the consumption, you know, consumer products, right, rather than the, you know, the investment products. And if you see what they're going to consume on the right chart, it shows that, you know, in terms of production, um, and employment as well, which means this is where you know the, the, the country is going. China wants to focus more on services, so that will be an area where they think that you know would be growing. You know, um, rather than manufacturing goods, you know, services will be you know, the, the next trend for China, right? So if we, you know, this is just a picture to show how the world may look like in the future, you know, in the global sense, and also in our regional, and also for China. Once we know this, then you know we, we we can then better prepare ourselves, you know, for this future, um, you know, global economy, right? So that's the picture of the global economy. So here is what I see as you know as challenges for Thailand in this new global economy. Well, first, as I mentioned to you, that you know the global economy is recovering, but it, it will grow slowly. It won't you know go back to its you know pre you know eurozone crisis growth. Right, so it will be growing slowly. So that means that um, you know we'll be having more competitors, but the market is not growing as quickly. So com competition will be more stiff, right? And as I mentioned, that you know the Chinese economy is slowing down, and they are restructuring more towards consumption uh, and, and the services sector as well. And because of the slowdown of the global economy, right, we see softening of oil prices, but at the same time also agriculture you know, and, and commodity prices as well. So as an agriculture you know, uh, ex exporter of rice and rubber, for example, you know, it is to be expected that you know, those prices will fall. So our export of revenues from those goods will, will definitely be lower than in the past, because as you can see on the chart that Rice and rubber prices will not go back, you know, to its high levels, at least in the foreseeable future. So, you know, when we when we know these information, we need to think: Do we still want to try to strive to be the number one rice producer in the world, or you know, the, or you know, the major rubber producer in the world? You know, or we should diversify to you know sectors or products which are more highly in demand, as Dr. Wing mentioned. You know, mobile phones. You know tablets or even services right so so you know these are things that you know we, we have to we have to keep in mind you know when we when we talk about restructuring you know of the Thai economy and of course you know we will see probably see the US raising interest rates in the you know at least well 
yesterday the the the, the you know the uh, FO uh, MC meeting um, has has said that you know they will probably you know not raise interest rates anytime soon, but then analysts are forecasting either at the end of the year or you know, at the beginning of next year. So interest rates in the US will rise will rise and that will definitely affect you know, interest rates in the world meaning that you know we may may have to raise our interest rates as well and that of course would impact definitely you know the you know the investments or even the consumption especially in a country like Thailand where household debt is pretty high right so it will affect the, the debt burden and um, you know just uh, a few more a couple more challenges I see well competition I mentioned already and don't forget Thailand's aging and that's a very important um, factor because in restructuring our economy, you know, if the economy is going to be, you know, primarily or, or, or you know, having an economy with more, you know, aged people, like older people, then it's probably not, um, it's probably not going to be easy for us to be in, you know, agriculture or be in, you know, like, labor-intensive industries where it's very physically demanding right, in the future. So this, you know, actually tells us that we will probably need to think about moving into sectors that are, you know, more knowledge intensive, right, with more innovation, with, um, you, know, you know, with less energy intensive <laughs> activities um, for an aging society like ours. But then in order to do that, I think, you know, one of the important things is, as Dr. Wong mentioned, is that we will, oh, sorry, here. We will probably to, you know, need to improve, you know, a lot of things, which is one is innovation, right? If we want to be more knowledge-based, we would need to improve our innovation, our labor productivity, for example. Um, here I've taken uh, some numbers from the WEF, the World Economic Forum, um, on world competitiveness rankings, right? And we, and we already see that from 2008 to 2015, Thailand's you know, overall ranking has fell by, by three ranks. But when we look at the sub you know, components, we see that, for example, in innovation, we fell by 31 ranks, right? While, you know, like Malaysia has increased, you know, it, it's, um, sorry, not Malaysia, uh, Philippines has increased, you know, its ranking. In labor market efficiency, which has to do with productivity as well, right? Thailand fell by 66, you know, ranks. So, you know, this is something that that you know, actually troubles you know me a bit when I see these um, these rankings because it just shows that you know, in comparison with other countries in the world, we are not as competitive anymore, especially in these areas where I say you know, Thailand should be moving into as we age, right? And uh, and so that we can move up the value chain as well. So when I see these numbers, you know, I you know I, I ask myself, so what you know. How does Thailand compare with other countries in terms of its labor productivity? Because here they have labor market efficiency, which has to, which has to do with both labor productivity and wages. So what I've done here is I've compared, you know, productivity growth and wage growth for each, you know, of these few countries in in, in Asia. And um, so basically, you know, what is a good situation is that when labor productivity growth is higher than wage growth, right? So, you know, if wage increases by 10%, labor productivity increases by 20%, that's great, you know, for a firm, that's great, right? So I just, what I did here was I just subtracted, you know, productivity growth with a wage. So if it's a positive number, it's good. So if the bar is high, it's good, right? So for Thailand, as you can see, from 2011 to 2014, our bar has been either very low or negative, right? which means that labor productivity growth has not caught up with wage growth. Well, as countries like, like you know, like China, right, or, the, or um, you know, or in the Philippines, have been actually um, growing, growing their productivity, you know, at a faster rate than wages. So you know, in terms of the competitiveness here, you know, it, it's, it's pretty clear that, you know, it, it's not, especially in this area, you know, Thailand is not com very competitive. And one of the reasons is because in 2012, we raised our minimum wage, and, and which is probably a good thing because minimum wages, you know, have 
not been uh, have been have been changing very slowly and have not caught up with inflation, right? So that but that big jump, you know, to 300 baht across the nation has then also lifted up the average wage. So wages in other you know and other professions have also risen as well. So you know, so our wage growth was quite high over the past you know two three years. But then when you look at the right chart, we see that our productivity growth in terms of labor productivity, you know, has actually has actually fallen. Right. So so this, you know, really talks about how, you know, we can, you know, improve our labor productivity, how, how much, you know, that's in need. So what I did was I did I so I look a bit closer, you know, using the Bank of Thailand's data to see you know, why is it that labor productivity growth has been low, right? So I disaggregated, um, according to Bank of Thailand's data, into different, you know, subsectors. And we found that, you know, from 2001 to 2014, sorry for the, for the um, years there, it's not showing, but it's from 2001 to 2014, that the sectors that, you know, have a very low, you know, growth, in labor productivity is agriculture and construction, right? For example, in agriculture, in 2001 it was 100. In 2014, 13 years later, it's 118.6, which means it only increased by 18.6 percent, right? From 100 to 118. In construction, it was 100 in 2001. By the time it, in 2014, it was only 89. So it means that, you know. Um, labor productivity growth was actually negative right in that period so you know it, it's a bit it's a bit uh, alarming because these two uh, sectors hire 40 percent of the labor force right the, you know the 40 percent of the labor force in there and, and and they're not productive and they're actually you know uh, made up of people who are mostly from the rural areas right who are you know working in agriculture or the or the construction sector so, you know, one of the ways, you know, if I may suggest to improve our labor productivity is, of course, to improve the, the productivity of these people in these, in these sectors, in these very labor intensive sectors. Or, you know, they could move out to the other sectors that are more productive, right? So let me just show you some figures and you will see why I'm saying that, right? So if you look at, you know, a snapshot, of of the employment and the you know and the production or GDP of Thailand, let's say in 2013, it doesn't change very much from year to year, right? We see that there is 39.6 percent of people working in the agriculture sector. That's a huge, almost 40 percent, right? But it only produces 8.3 percent of GDP, right? So you know. You know, that's a very telling story. So, so it just means that there's just too many people in our agricultural sector. We can try to improve their productivity, but if they still remain in this, you know, you know, over supply of, you know, uh, of people uh, in this sector, they will not be able to increase their productivity much. So, you know, there's still some room for them to move out to other sectors as well. If you look at the manufacturing sector, it only employs 14% of the labor force, right? But it produces 38.1% of, of production in the country. It's very productive. It's very productive, right? Services. Here's an, another very interesting story. It hires 45.7% of the labor force, and it produces about 47.8% of production. So about one to one, about one to one. So it's not as productive as the manufacturing sector. So here, you know, if we were to think of, you know, sort of the big picture of economic restructuring in Thailand, I would, I would say the agriculture, you know, people in the agricultural sector could be moved out to either the manufacturing or the services sector because there are just too many people in the agricultural sector at the moment. But at the same time, the services sector needs to improve its productivity as well, right? Because the productivity here is quite low. And the services sector is actually, you know, a sector that older people can work in, right? As I mentioned, that as we're aging, and here I'm talking about higher value service sector, you know, not taxi drivers or masseuse or waitresses, right? Here I'm talking about engineers, doctors, you know, accountants. 
these are all, you know, professions, uh, professionals in the higher value added services sector. So all this boils down to can we move people out of the you know, sectors which, which have an oversupply of labor and at the same time improve their productivity because they will be able to you know, work in, in, in sectors that are, uh, uh, have higher productivity, such as the higher productivity services sector. So to, to do that, I think one of the you know, key, key, very key factor to, to achieve that is through education. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's, the quality of the human capital is probably the most, the single most important, you know, aspect in any country in moving up, you know, the value chain and moving towards a high income country. No matter it be South Korea, or whether it be, you know, Singapore or Japan, countries that have managed to move up to be a high income country have all focused on their human capital development, right? So that is, you know, I think the single most important thing that China would need to focus from now on. And because when I, when I look at the standardized scores that um, Thai students take, right, the left chart shows Thailand PISA scores. This is the international test that is done in 80 countries in the local language in three subjects, reading, math, and science. Thailand's scores are, you know, not, you know, are still below those of like, so this is the score, the left chart is a score in Bangkok. It's lower than that in Shanghai, in Tokyo, you know, so we, we can't compare to those, right? But the surprising thing is our scores are even lower than rural Vietnam, right? So that's something that, that's very telling because Vietnam is really up and coming country and they really focus on their, their you know, human capital improvements. And when we actually look at where in Thailand are the scores really weak, and we, we actually see on the right chart that it's in villages and towns, right? So big cities have, have higher scores, although even, even the high, those, those big city scores are not you know, as high as rural Vietnam. <laughs> but if you look at rural Thailand, it's much worse, right? So if we were to concentrate our energy you know, in improving the education, the basic education, it would be in those, in those uh, small schools in, in, in that, those areas. So I would just like to end by saying that, you know, Human capital development is probably the single most important, not only for economic growth, but also for reducing income inequality in Thailand. I just want to end with this because I think you know growth itself is not sustainable if it's not well distributed. Because you know, at the end of the day, you know, there will be political and social problems when there are you know inequality in the country. And Thailand apparently is now in you know, a country that has the highest in income inequality you know in, in East Asia. Right, our bar is the highest. Although we've managed to reduce it in the past 10 years, but we're still the highest. So, you know, with education comes, you know, better opportunities to jobs, you know, to income. So that would, you know, help not only, you know, solve the productivity, the growth issue, it would probably also help, you know, reduce the income gap as well. It would make Thailand's growth more sustainable into the future. So that's you know, what I have to say in this first round. Thank you very much.